So I think you said, I, I'm going to pretend I know what you said. It was all true. Um, I was born in Trinidad. I, I left when I was one. And my background is not, well, it's now art. But I grew up, I wasn't an artist. I didn't draw. I wasn't one of those kids coming up with worlds. Um, I was, when I went to Dart, I went to Dartmouth for college and I studied psychology. And it literally, I was a store manager at this kind of hip, trendy store. And I just wanted one night not to be in the store. So I just took a ceramics class at a community center and then two years later I went to grad school. <laughs> so it's a whole new world. So I, you probably know more than I know about art. <laughs> just putting that out there. Um, so in my work, this piece is called Winter Hung to Dry. And in the work I'm often looking at our, um, uh, at our relationship to objects, um, objects and spaces. And when I'm, when I'm looking at them, I'm trying to think of how I can shift, shift our understanding of it. I'm thinking about domesticity and nostalgia. So in this piece, it's at a place called the Soap Factory. And it, so it's an abandoned soap factory that's now an art institution. So I decided to hang all of my winter clothes on this line. It's probably maybe twice the size of this room. And I wanted it to kind of, you have to kind of deal with this weighty weightlessness. You have this pile of clothing that's acting as a surrogate for the body. And you're having to kind of deal with this, this form that's kind of the embodiment of who we are. So the piece is a bit melancholy, but I really wanted it to be funny. It's absurd as well. Like cl winter clothes, you wouldn't hang on a clothesline because it'd be cold out. So I was hoping that would come through. This piece is called um, Ridgewood Line. And I did it at this place called the Sculpture Center in New York. And it used to be, it's an abandoned, it was an abandoned trolley track um, repair shop. So I decided to kind of mine these, the space below, which were the tunnels where the trolleys would come through. And I decided to create a, a concrete street with these embedded trolley tracks. So I wanted to really just use the history of the, of the space. It's what it, what it was, but how can I kind of make you deal with it now? So I made, I embedded these trolley tracks, and above you can see the line, the, the trolley line ahead. And I kept thinking, I was really interested in how can I make architectural interventions where once you, you don't notice them, once you're kind of in it, you don't, you don't notice it at all. And then maybe after some time you've spent in it, all of a sudden you see it, and then all of a sudden it doesn't seem absurd. You kind of believe this fiction. So I had a lot of people who actually thought that this was actually there. Um, and I had the specificity of the work is often important for me. Like if I can be very specific as opposed to being very general, I, I can allow for more universality to happen. So in this piece, I had different reactions that happened. I, I had someone tell me they thought it was like a reference to the Underground Railroad, which is part of African American history, the slavery, of, of, uh, the, the passageway that the slaves moved up north. I had a, a Jewish um, Holocaust survivor come to me in tears, and she said, it, it, you know, you look at that, and it's like you're thinking about the end of that tunnel. So it's kind of amazing that it started from one place, but it allowed for kind of these bicycle spokes of understanding. This piece is called It's Not Over Till It's Over, and I did it at another space in New York. It's, it's a sculpture park called Socrates Sculpture Park. And I, when I would visit the parks ahead of time to try to figure out what I wanted to do, I realized it was functioning, yes, as a sculpture park, but it also was like a dog park, or there were film screens, or there was a lot of yoga happening, and kites. So I kept thinking of other kinds of parks. So I thought, OK, uh, 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 I was thinking about playground, but I was also thinking about amusement parks. So I kept thinking, like, what, would I, what can I do here that's kind of reminiscent of that? So I decided to build a merry-go-round to scale. And instead of having all the lights in this, no, you guys have merry go everywhere has merry-go-rounds, right? right? OK, good. So the, the noise and lights, the blah, the blah. I decided, like, how can I strip it down to kind of like the essence? But I was also thinking about growing up in Brooklyn, I'd go to Coney Island, kind of, which is this big amusement park. Um, and I would go, I would go with my family, and you would have to, the beginning of the season, they would still make you wait until like every, every damn seat was filled. So you could wait like a half an hour, literally, to, get, to, to go on the ride. So I was thinking about like that, that anticipation as a kid of waiting, but then also thinking about when the ride ends, you don't want it to end, but then they make you go back in the line and wait again. So I was thinking maybe as an adult, I can make a ride just for me, yeah. selfishly, but also one that doesn't end. And it's going clockwise, which is different than in the States, they're counterclockwise. And for me, it was important to have it go forward so that in a way, so it doesn't get too stuck in nostalgia or something. But I was also thinking of this thing that you see from afar, you approach it, you recognize, like, oh, I know what this thing is. And then once you're on it, it starts to slowly unravel. Like, the things that are familiar disappear. Like, the horses aren't there. This music isn't there. There's just a little bit of lope lighting at the bottom. And all of a sudden, you're moving forward. So I was, trying to, I was hoping that it could also talk about, I was thinking how amusement parks 
are there to, bom to, to bombard your senses to the point where you lose yourself. But I was hoping maybe in the act of being alone, that aloneness, you can kind of, the same activity can happen where you lose yourself. And I was thinking about loneliness, but I was thinking more about aloneness and how that exists. So this is like one, one day at the park, and I had a really ex interesting experience this night. It was like one of the last nice days of the summer, and I decided to go videotape it, because I'd only taken stills, and there was this man, I call him the loneliest man, I couldn't even take a picture of him. He was sitting on the chair, kind of slumped down, like really almost like in agony. Like it looked very painful to watch, and I started to think I made the saddest piece. Like I made a really, this is depressing, and I had someone else tell me, this, the director of Skohegan, this residency in, in the States, said, I cried while I was on it. And I was like, damn it, what the hell? But then, so he left, and there was an event happening at the other end of the park. And at one point, there were, I don't know, 60 kids on this thing. And they kept trying to like go faster, faster, trying to push. I'm like, don't break it. And then, so the kids left, and then at the, I don't have a picture, because I felt like I couldn't do it. There was a, after the kids left, there was like two moms like holding newborns, and it was like, oh, it was the most, beautiful thing, I felt as though it kind of went through the psychological and potentially emotional experiences I was hoping it would do. Um, oh, great. This um, is perfect. Yeah. Questions to break up my, like, monotony, you know? Um, I just wanted to ask if the chair is always there. Yeah, the chair is there. And, like, people can take pictures of you? Well, it was, no, I, I, it's New York. That thing was... <laughs> oh, yeah, I was surprised. That thing was asked. there. Yeah, no, I did it again. Yeah, it, it kept, it's, oh, I should have said that. It takes five minutes to make one revolution. So it's like the kids were frustrated because they used to, it's kind of ecstatic, that ride. It kind of did. Like, uh, yeah, because I was kind of thinking if the park, if the amusement park is usually about like overdoing things, like to the extreme, if I do the reverse or like slow it down in a way, wow. you have to kind of face yourself. In a way, like this, you're watching the East River. Is that the East River? Yeah. Watching the East River. And then looking, kind of dealing with yourself. But my friends say it was a breakup piece. Like I, <laughs> in the end it was. And I said, what did I do wrong? You're going in circles. I really think it's a breakup piece. But anyway, okay, this piece is called Bench, um, Seeking for One. So, okay, this was done at an art school out in Portland, Oregon. And okay, not interesting. A brick wall, you take the outside, bring it inside. Artists have been doing that forever. But I was hoping you'd enter the gallery and say, okay, there's this brick wall. But the piece is called Bench Seating for One, so I made, on the other side, there's like a seat for one person. So I kept thinking, I wanted to, I was thinking about minimalism, but I was thinking, you know, minimalism was all about, okay, now it's not necessarily just about the object, it's about the activity that's happening around it. It's like, oh, the temperature, oh, the social of someone else being there, the object is almost, you know, inconsequential, it's not part of it. But I wanted to not, not really think about that, I wanted to think about kind of pushing that idea where the sculpture is only functioning with your back to it. So it's like a way you're giving the, the art an, the finger. So it's only functioning if you're sitting sitting on it. But I was also thinking at the time I had just reread, um, oh, what was it? Ecstasy of Communication. And he talks about you know the blurring of a public and private space. And at this time I was traveling between New York and Houston every week. So I was aware, I, was, I would be on an airplane and you're hearing people have these pretty intimate conversations. And I kept thinking about, OK, the private is happening in the public, and it's even more extreme now. But the idea is like, are we becoming more insular in the public? Or what does it mean that that's happening? But I was also thinking about this space. So someone comes and has this kind of private moment sitting there, knowing that someone could be walking behind the other side of the wall, and also knowing that above the gallery is the student lounge. So I wanted to kind of play around with that idea of the public and private. But I also just wanted to give a gift to the students, like, so they don't have to look at damn art for like, oh my god, there's a sculpture, a thing where I don't have to, nothing on the walls, you know? Or, or even with a gallery goer coming in and saying, where is the art, and hoping that I could just change that experience a bit. So this piece is called Coffee Table. I'm not very um, creative with my titles. Um, I did this at um, PS1 MoMA. They have this show every five years, Great in New York, of like the new up and coming, I guess, artists. And again, I'm thinking about minimalism. I'm also thinking about, it's definitely a nod to surrealism. Um, but I was thinking, but, and it is very specifically related to those art historical movements, but it really came from me spending the summers in Trinidad. You know, there was two TV channels, so we didn't really watch TV because the shows they were showing were like two years old from the States, you know, so it was n just wasn't relevant. And it, we really, the coffee table, that space, the living room really functioned. Like, my granddad would sing, and 
stories were told. It was really this activated space. So I kept thinking, you know, what has happened that today, you know, the coffee table is just there, like what we do, to put your food while you're watching Netflix or <laughs> watching TV. Like, what happened to that space that it's shifted in that way? So I was thinking, how can I maybe make it, like, literally part of the room? So I made this column, so it was like you can't avoid it. But in my attempt to make it part, to make it alive, I've, I've rendered it kind of immobile. You can't really use it. So this is a de-installation shot from my thesis show at, at Cranbrook. And it's called Whispering Dome. So you don't, this is just to show you what I did. This is like I lowered the ceiling to this height. So the space was maybe um, a quarter of this room. And there were two shallow domes. And I figured that when I was under the domes, I noticed the acoustics were a little altered. So I thought maybe if I lowered the ceiling, it'd become more, I wasn't sure. And this was like the thesis show. And I'm like, I think that's going to happen. It's going to get more dramatic. So I lowered the ceiling. And it was funny. It was, it was pretty seamless. And it, for me, it had to be seamless with the architecture. But a lot of people missed it. And I, you have to be OK with that. With the, the trolley track piece, I remember this artist, Fred Wilson, he said, Karen, I'm going to come see your piece. And remember, he said, well, where is it? Like, where the hell is your piece? Oh, and, Um, so I like when that, so it's this thing where I like when it happens when the work could be seamless with the architecture or you almost don't even realize it's art or something. So on one level, I kind of love that half of the museum goers missed it. But then it's the idea of like how myopic are we in our day to day? Do we just go from point A to B and not really think about, not really present and aware of what's around us? So hopefully someone's curious and they think, well, why is the ceiling so low? And they might bend down. So you bend down and you kind of stand up in this kind of James Terrell kind of expansive space, the heavens have opened up, you know, that kind of experience. So it became very um, ethereal in there. And because it's a, you know, curved sheet rock, you know, that not having that, those corners, like a real spatial disorientation thing happened. But I was hoping that if other people enter, you'll realize kind of like this, the piece isn't over yet. So once someone else enters and you speak, you realize that acoustics have altered your voice and it's different in each dome because of the size. And this is my class, my thesis um, thesis class. And at a certain point, conversation stopped, and people were just like making music. And the light comes from outside, or you put those on No, the, the domes had these lights that were kind of embedded in, so you couldn't see oh. them. So I still think it's like the best piece I made was my grad thesis, a piece that keeps on giving. You know, you have one expectation, then the next, compression, then expansion, then it's like, sound? What? It's so good. OK. So this piece is, uh, I, think call, I think I just call it Logs. <coughs> and I did it at this residency in, in, in Maine called Skohegan. You guys should all apply to it. It's, it's amazing. It's just amazing group of artists, amazing faculty. It'll propel your career to places you haven't expected it to go. So up in Maine, it's logging country. And I, I got pretty, pretty obsessed with the logging. And I would follow the log trucks, I don't know, for four hours to see where they ended up. And it was kind of painful because then you end up with just these piles. It looked like dead bodies of just logs. So I kept all these logs in my studio. And I was trying to think of what I can do with them. So I just left them on the floor. But then I would hear like this like, like a crunching sound, like a <laughs> kind of sound. And then there would be a pile of saw, you know, sawdust. So I decided to suspend them in the rafters in my studio. And I closed up the window. I kind of made this white cube. And I, I had this fabric that was kind of semi-translucent. -trans so I wanted to kind of, kind of have like the constructed you know, white cube below and kind of had nature, almost fabricated nature above. But I wanted that fabric to kind of be this place of a, both a like tension and a filter between these two spaces. And it was strange. It was one of those things that some people loved it. I mean, Carrie Mae Weems was my faculty that summer. And she's like, Karen, can I have an afternoon to be in your space? Because she loved how it felt. And other people said, they're hearing the sounds. They can't look. They can locate it, but it's disoriented, and they couldn't exist in that space. So I, I like that kind of like whatever your psychology, your emotional state is how you're going to enter the work. So that's like on the other side of the fabric, the sawdust drawings. There I am, and I was at the time I was doing all this work, kind of dealing with my height as the like me at the center of the work. So the, I, this is the first version of the coffee table I did in my studio at Cranbrook. And it was an old dorm room. So, I, so this is kind of when I started thinking about domesticity and domestic spaces. So I did this piece. And this is another one of those pieces where I, I made this piece. And then 
I got asked to be in that Greater New York show, and I'm showing them all my new work, and they're like, we want that piece. <laughs> and I was like, but that's old work. They were not interested in the new work. But I've done this piece several times, but it was great to like, think about where, where it began. It was really tied to my studio, which was a, an old room. So I kept thinking, so I did that piece, and then I kept thinking, well, let me think about another object. So I thought of a chair. And I was like, what's the least I can do to kind of change its function? So I took out the caning, and I just replaced it with these steel rods. They're, they're eighth inch, they're, they're pretty. So when you saw it, it felt as though they were kind of vibrating. And I don't know how crits work here, but um, it was right before um, winter break, my second year. And it was one of those crits where no one said anything. And you're thinking, this work is good. <laughs> you guys just don't get it. <laughs> get it. But then you realize, so then I came back from winter break feeling like, OK, I'm feeling like I'm good. And my faculty, you have one faculty per department. He's like, you know, I had to live with that piece for four weeks because they lived on campus, the faculty. And he's like, I went from thinking it was OK to hating it. It's not interesting. It dead ended. Take it down. So I left it up for about two and a half weeks. And it was partly to, in, in spite of him, but I kept thinking about there was something about this view that was still exciting from outside. Like it functioned like that, that ceiling, like that filter. But once I was inside, it kind of lost it. So I kept thinking about this as a, as a space. So I decided to visit this idea for my, this was, I thought was going to be my thesis piece. But then I, he told me I had to make another one like two weeks before. It was a lot. But anyway, so I decided to ma remake my studio 70% smaller. So I made everything that was in it. But then I decided I wanted it to be just enough objects where, where the, the fiction that I've created becomes real. Or like the what's inside, the, the fictive space is more real or more comfortable than the, the space in between is about, you know, this much. So I, so, I, so I decided, I, like, I made the sink, and I decided I didn't need it. I was like, but it seemed to be this was the key thing, this, this, this window. And I, as I said, I was in ceramics, so I had to kind of learn how to do all this stuff. It was pretty, pretty exciting to have to learn all of this. And again, it's a, of course, it's like a nod to surrealism. I can't avoid those, those guys. So before I finished the piece, I had to have like a, a, like a mid-semester review. So I decided to put photographs of of some of the objects just to give them a sense of what it was going to look like. And if for a minute I thought maybe I should just leave the photographs. You know, photographs, you know, the representations of things are, are, are the perfect standing and the things we surround ourselves are kind of imbued with meaning when we look at that, when we look at that image. So I, but then I realized that if I did it, it would make sense if it was to scale. It didn't make sense to reduce scale. So I was like, well, maybe in the future I'll, I'll think of something with this idea. So when I was at the core program, same program that um, Gila and I met, uh, I did a, I remade my living room to scale, and I, I, I printed photographs of my living room onto the sheet rock so it was embedded in the material. But I revisited the idea again in a, a four-day show in Bushwick in, no, in October, last October. It was crazy. It was so much work for like four days. But that's, it's about the moment, right? It's not about like the piece being there forever, right? So I. What I, the, the premise of the show is this, this um, curator from Switzerland who, who, cur who was working with this um, gallery in, in Bushwick. The idea was that you'd have four artists do four installations in the homes of uh, folks who live in the neighborhood, or four different um, neighborhood uh, tenants. So in order to see the work, you go to the gallery, and what you see is the displaced objects from the, the home. And when you have to kind of meet up, you have to kind of get the phone number for the person whose home it is. So it's this kind of like vulnerability and a, almost like a contract you have to make with the person <coughs> to go see the work. So I decided, so this is the, these are all the objects from the, from the living room. And this is like kind of a panorama to see, see what happened. But I love the idea about the vulnerability of the gallery goer. They have to kind of leave the safety of like the gallery row and kind of go four blocks off site to, to someone's home. But I was also thinking about the vulnerability of the person who has, your, your living room is a public, it's the most public of your private space, but there's some things that you still might not want to reveal beyond those walls. So the idea of like they're letting their, their life be on display. But I kept thinking it on another level, I was allowing them, I wanted to make this piece for the, the folks who live in this apartment. So I thought about sometimes objects, we surround ourselves with objects and they are imbued with meaning and we kind of need them, but there's also a burden to them. 
like you see all that dust on that, you know, you see the dust that you need to clean that you don't have time to do, or the pile of art books or books that you feel like you should read and you haven't read. So I felt in a way I gave him like four, a four day respite. So literally I just hung it like a, you know, almost like a theater drop. You just tacked it up and kind of just let it hang and then just ripped it down and at the end. So I kind of let things like that happen where you're kind of revealing that it's just representation. It's not the real thing. I kind of messed up there, but it, I think in the end it, it worked out, the printing. So I've done a series of, I did for about five years, a series of a series of sculptures that were kind of around the idea of playgrounds. So in the, in the background, this is a piece called Tetherball, and I guess I don't have to say titles, I realize. <laughs> um, so I have these 30, it's 130 tetherballs that are hanging from the, the top, and they're from far away, they really read as concrete and kind of static. And I was thinking about modernism and the failure of like architectural, like modernist architecture and the, these these monolithic presence that, that that don't function. So I was thinking about like having this 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 game tetherball be represented that way. When the game, to me, whenever I think about the game, it's always about like sky and and movement, like kind of like the ball having this like static dance with the sky. So instead of having that, I've kind of rendered it kind of mute and 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 and, and solid. But the, I was hoping that when people come close, they realize, okay, from that interpretation of it being kind of concrete, when you get closer, you realize it's just covered with like pigment and clay powder. So it's really pretty ephemeral. You know, you touch them and they kind of kind of move and it kind of dust dust falls from them. So I've dealt with the tetherball a couple times. Um, I did this piece back in 2005, and then I re had to remake the piece. I was g doing a show in Mexico City last year or the year before, and I was gonna ship the tetherball to the site, and then it turns out it was super expensive. And then we figured, okay, I'll just buy tetherballs when I'm there, and we'll, we'll do the piece. So when I get there, tetherballs don't exist. So then we bought children's like felt balls, and then I was able to paint them and then cover them with the powder, but then I had to sew, sew the, the line on there. So I, this one, I, I, I set it up and it was fine, but I came back like an, like an hour later and it was totally deflated. I think I punctured it when I was sewing. But there was something so beautiful, like to me it captured almost like combining the tetherball piece in terms of photograph. It, it's doing exactly what I was hoping the sculpture would do. This is a photograph from a a playground at our church school in Nigeria, and I fell in love with this this monkey bar. I'd never seen a, a monkey bar that quite looked like that, but I and I kept thinking about monkey bars, how they're constructed. They're made to kind of lend support. They can handle the body, and I was thinking about my mom in Trinidad. She fell off like a monkey bar, you know, and it's super hot there, so that it was like tar underneath the the monkey bar structure, and she fell, and her two front teeth got stuck in the the tar, and I always, I kept wanting to do a piece dealing with that, but I kept thinking about childhood, and, and, and there's, a, there's a real, there's a fragility, and there's a vulnerability, but there's also like a resilience, like, yeah, she got up and kept wanting to keep playing, and they had to take her away, so I kept thinking about that, but I was also thinking about, um, like, childhood, I wanted, that, that, that object, I was thinking, if I can make it out of another material, so I made it out of poplar you could almost like fold it and just take it with you, like portable childhood or something. Um, and then I was thinking about someone like Martin Perrier, who was one of my art art heroes. You guys know his work? Was beautiful, even though yeah, I don't love him the way I used to love him. So, so this piece is called Seesaw, and it's long. It's probably the length of this room. And I was, at the time, I was thinking about playgrounds and how they're really like charged psychological spaces. I think it's like one of the earliest arenas where kids kind of have to deal with politics in a way, like they have to deal with like power and privilege or difference or someone is stronger than another. They have to deal with race and and gender and class issues. So I think it's such an interesting space. So seesaws are usually like 10 feet, so this is like four times as long. And I was traveling, this is still the period when I was traveling between Houston and, and New York, and I was thinking about distance and intimacy and how they can happen, happen at the same time. And I was thinking about the tension I want this piece to kind of be imbued with tension in terms of the actual physical structure, but also thinking about the vulnerability and like emotional or psychological vulnerability to this piece as well. 
So in a way, you had to kind of navigate this awkward plank with someone else. So you had to find another way to communicate to make this thing work. And I wasn't expecting, so I knew it would be fun. I was like, oh, it's going to be fun, a huge seesaw. But I wasn't expecting the experience to be what it was. Like you, when you got on it and you wrote it, it was a, that other thing. I was telling the students earlier this morning about being on stilt walking. Like you felt like the air like got quiet or like suspended. And you, it was this graceful kind of movement through the space. And it was so strange to have that experience when it was absent of like kind of a, the ruckus of a, of a playground. So you're having that experience, but it's totally this other kind of transporting experience. At some point, um, that, that, that ended up being in, in someone's backyard. She's like, my grandchild would love it. So it's in someone's home, home in DC. Um, so I did a series of, I think I'm gonna show a series of photographs. This one's called Double Houses. And this was in the same show with the playground piece, the tetherball piece. And I kept thinking, of course I thought about Gordon Mattaclark, his splitting splitting piece, but I kept looking at these houses that at first they seem like they're identical, but they're really kind of a mirror of each other, and I'm a twin, so I always think about that. But I think about how these houses could maybe still be in, be squatted in, but they seem like on their, they're on the edge of, of existing, and, the, and then this bucket, and the steps of that, that bucket that was there for months, hanging on. This piece is called uh, Favelas in 2 by 4 so on the photos, I'm trying to kind of compress disparate, disparate images. So that's a uh, favela in Rio and a two by four. And I was thinking about, and the series is called Double Vision, but I'm trying to think of the idea of like maybe creating some sort of slide of eye or creating these two images that are disparate, but they can be read the same or, or the same that can be um, ruptured in a way. And my hope is that that line of where they meet, there's something about that tension of that line. There's something about that two by four and the angle. I'm hoping it's seeming like it's, at once it's like the building material of those houses, but somehow it's almost like piercing that architecture. It speaks about the politics of that space and politics of how we construct, instruct, inst um, construct neighborhoods and who has the power. This piece is called Wonder Wheel Cemetery and it's the cemetery wall my grandfather's um, buried on the other side. And this is a kind of like a slice from a photograph of um, the Wonder Wheel and in Coney Island. So there's something about, I can feel like, again, that the, play, the amusement park, something about the ecstatic of that space of what it allows. Somehow it seems to me to be the same as what can happen in a cemetery. Somehow it just seems like they're the same place, as strange as that might sound. But, I, but then later on, as people have had other references, now you know, in the States we're having a lot of problems where black men are just being kind of unduly killed. So I keep thinking this has another kind of resonance now. We have this kind of black like a fragmented black body kind of below ground, below, below. So it's now taking on a different meaning than I originally intended. So this is an image of like an early flying machine. And I was thinking of this guy. I found this photograph in this outsider art book. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read. I'm going to just read something. It's uh, the opening scene from um, Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon. It's one of my favorite books. One of the locals, an insurance salesman, posts notices all around the town saying he'll stand on the roof of the town hospital, jump off, and fly across Lake Superior to the other side. The day comes and a few people gather and see Mr. Smith with his blue silk wings on the roof. Mr. Smith jumps and the scene ends. So, of course, he, he dies, but there's something about, I keep thinking about this photograph in relation to that, and I was thinking about the first attempts at flight, and I was thinking about kind of a I was thinking about melancholy and hope and desire and longing and how they kind of all shame, share the same sort of psychological space. And then my friend Secret Sandstrom, who you guys should get here, um, get her to come here, Pilar. She, has, she came out with this little this book a couple years ago called Great Hope, The Persistence of Melancholy. And she has this description of a sky jumper as having an empty belief that falling is a version of flight. So I keep thinking about this longing and this desire we have, like what is it about this desire to go beyond what's our potential or like where's the, the edge of that? And what does it mean, the idea of like this melancholy and hope, that they kind of lack the concrete but they're so weighted in our, in our psyche. So it's a piece, that, so I made this bike and I modeled after, this was an early um, flying machine and the, the event, it was this huge event 
And on the day it was to take off, I think it lifted off the ground, I think it had 18 inches. So I hear of like this whole like drama and then that it seemed like a failure, but the failure isn't really there because then it, it led to this other thing. So I wanted to make a piece kind of dealing with this. So I decided to make um, this bike to the point where it has like all these, you know, wings and bike, um, box kite wings. So the idea I'm trying to like add all this thing to make it work more and more and more, but in a way, my effort has left it <coughs> kind of, <laughs> it can't function. So I made this piece once before, and it, it didn't, I never thought it worked. I think it's like one of those pieces I really think about the ideas behind it the most, and it, I think it doesn't work. When I did it before, it was really CNC cut, so everything was perfectly welded, and, and it felt, and I had an old, like, nostalgic bike, so it just was so stuck in nostalgia. And, so I think here it was better. Like I didn't have much time there. We hired these welders who weren't very good. So the weld, the cuts were like just raw and rough. And there was something, and then had this like hipster high-end bike. So something about that seemed to work better. And then I added a propeller, which was really noisy and barely <laughs> spun <laughs> on the back. So I still don't think it's a, it's a good piece, but it still kind of holds a lot, um, a lot for me. So this to me is like the the, the counter to. The seesaw, you know, I think about, I could think about it metaphorically, like relationships, you know, sometimes, you know, you have to, it's volatile, you have to kind of collide. So it's hoping you could be about childhood, of course, and playground, but it's also, it's I'm hoping it's metaphoric work. This, um, this was at the Studio Museum in Harlem, but then it was in a sculpture park for a couple of years in St. Louis, and I heard at one point there was like a football team, high school football team were <laughs> on it at once, so I'm glad it, it's made it back. <laughs> so, uh, so do you guys have handballs? Yeah. You have? You don't see it? Damn, ham I'm obsessed with handball walls. They're so beautiful. It's a game that I'm not very good at, but I, I used to try to play it a lot. So I'm still thinking about urban playgrounds. And, and I was thinking about, it's like kind of like this mammoth, like intimidating wall, and of course, it makes me think of minimalism, like, but I think about its role, the wall's role, and how it's, it's not like, it's not like in basketball, you know, the ball has to go in the hoop, or in soccer, the, you know, the ball has to go in the goal. Here, this, this game is all about deflection. It's all about, it's almost as though the wall is incidental to the activity, so everything's happening literally, really around it. So I was thinking about that, but I was also thinking about, it's one of those games I mean, it's like should be like the new monument. The, it's like the, the most proletariat game. Like you just someone has to have a ball, and you just you can play. You don't need anything. You don't need to buy fancy equipment for it. You can just show up and play. So I decided I wanted to make this wall. So I made this, which was probably the hardest installation I've ever done. I only had a couple days. I knew the gallery had a wall they were going to take down. So I told them, well, could we keep the structure? And I'll put like foam on top of it, and, and I tested in my studio this um, this cement with this mesh to work. And when I got there, the material I thought we were going to use wasn't available, so it ended up being a whole different process. But because it was so large, it's, it was, and I mixed everything by hand, so it was like 80-pound bags of concrete being mixed individually. So it was, I love in a way. I was first upset by how flawed it is, you know, but then I realized that's kind of the, kind of like the beauty of it. You know, the bag that I mixed at, you know, nine at night is going to have the same sort of energy, different energy than the bag I mixed at five in the morning. So I kind of liked that it revealed some sort of personality. So I was hoping someone comes into the gallery and they see this, they're thinking, okay, she bought the outside, inside, she bought the ga a game, this, the, this handball wall is bought inside, so now there's an invitation to play in the gallery. Maybe it's a new kind of barricade, maybe it's Maybe it's, an, maybe it's um, a new surface. Almost, I like that it could potentially be all those things. So I thought it was going to really have that relationship to architecture and to games and play. And, and it ended up becoming like a two-sided, big-ass painting. And it, was, it wasn't, you know, it recalls, and it, I messed up. It was like really an hour before the opening. And, and I realized I painted it. I just measured wrong, and I painted the line here. I just was sporting no sweet. So then I kind of painted the line again, and then but I realized those flaws really echo back to like what they look like in Europe. They just kind of cover up the graffiti and <laughs> they don't bother painting the whole thing over. They're just what we need. 
So End of Heaven is kind of, for me, like this relationship to painting. Like, of course, someone like Barnett Newman's zip paintings, um, texture paintings. So I was pretty excited about that. It was doing a little cracking, but I thought in the end, it's okay. And then I put the ball in the raft because I wanted to, to at least have the idea maybe it's about it, it, someone did use it and the ball got stuck there and you can't like, you can't get it. So I did this project at the Whitney, Whitney Museum had a, a outpost near, across the street from Grand Central Station. I was pretty excited to use that space because it was a transitory space, it was space outside of the museum. I'm always psyched when it doesn't have to be the kind of traditional um, space. So I was thinking about jungle gyms in like the early 1900s in cities in, New in, the, in the States. There was this thing of saying, okay, there's all these immigrants coming and they're thinking, well, what do we, what do, we do? And people are thinking, well, we need parks. We need the, the kids to have spaces with clean air. There's trees, they can breathe, they can relax. And there's a whole other movement saying, no, they need spaces where they could just be wild and crazy. So there were these um, jungle gyms that were, I don't know, two times the height of this, this room, pretty amazing. I was thinking how we just don't have that anymore, like that's gone. So I was thinking maybe I can make a, one of those jungle gyms in this space so that maybe people could kind of move through it. But it really, you couldn't like activate it. It was handmade out of poplar like pieces. And, but I wanted to kind of play with that idea of like what's, what's permissible, what's allowed, and what's not. So this is an image of a, of a ro Roman, um, Roman toilet. And I was asked to do a project at the Vanus Foundation in, in Sweden. It's this great um, sculpture park, and they have a crystal. They have, it's also the largest organic farm in, in Europe they have on the site. So I did a site visit maybe I don't know, six months before the show. And I spent a lot of time, I spent more of my time with the, the animals, the, the farm animals. So I would like go into the cow stable and you'd see some there take with my camera taking pictures and like all the cows would like turn and look at you. And it was this weird thing of knowing that they're used to being invaded, but I all of a sudden I felt like their their life is on pub it's in public display, but it's like but it's private moments for them. So I felt that I kept saying, sorry, I just need to kind of feel this place. Um, so I decided I wanted and then I was thinking how in Sweden the you know communal outhouses existed up until very recently. So I kept thinking about like what is shifted in history, what has shifted in our, and in culture where those kind of spaces don't make sense anymore. Like the idea of like, you could both be there talking about what needs to be get done for that day, and it could function, but now we kind of, we kind of keeping it this, this separation from that, all of a sudden something totally abject. Um, so I decided to make uh, a really long one. I think there are 30, 30 openings. And again, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a nod to Donald Judd, you know. I, I can't escape those damn minimalist guys. But the great thing about it, I didn't have to make this, which was great. Like I just made a mini version. Um, so, but I love that the molds, like, I feel like those are like pea stains or something. So I keep thinking like, you know, you have to shit on your heroes, you know, to get, to get past. And I had this guy tell me, he's like, perverted minimalism, that's what you're making. And I said, yeah. specific and then you find it. I need to. Wow, that's, I feel like, how do I go on now? Just go on. Okay. Well, we don't have that much left, guys, so don't get worried. Well, six more pages of notes. Okay. Time check. Okay, more than 10 minutes? Okay. So this piece is called Great Lift, and I did it at a place called the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh. And they have a big museum, but they also have spaces that are in old houses. So I was excited to do something in one of those other spaces. And I decided, so this was an old shopkeeper's home. The shop would be downstairs and up above us is the home. So I wanted to kind of replace the lighting that was there with what would have been there at the time of its height. So I put these, um, this candelabra and I had lit candles for the six month duration of the show. And I decided to take away kind of like this thick amount of paint on the bottom. So I was hoping, being in Pittsburgh was so strange. I mean, it was an industrial city that was of such prominence and 
You go now, when I did a site visit, you're walking and you're seeing these hills filled with houses and knowing that maybe a quarter of those houses are, people are living there. So I was thinking again about that weighty weightlessness. So I wanted something about that space to kind of represent a body there. So over the course of six months, you know, it was just filled with, with, with candle um, dripping that just accumulated. So this is a project I did. I, I applied for a grant in Houston to do a billboard project where I would build the billboard structure and, and create an image. And I wanted to do something in this area called the Third Ward, which is a predominantly black neighborhood in, in Houston. And I wanted to, to do something where I could counter the aver negative advertising that you often see in black and poor neighborhoods, where it's usually for you know things you don't want to promote, like alcohol and fast food, McDonald's, and things like that. So I decided, let me get this grant and do a, put up a billboard in the neighborhood that could, we could decide what we want it to be. So I was in the park hanging out with these guys, um, Alan the Big Will, I don't know him, but he decided to stay in for the picture. Um, and I decided to take a picture and I was like, well, why can't it just be a celebration of us, of people who live here? The, the billboard was gonna be near there. So I took this photograph and I was, I was I, it was kind of spontaneous. I thought I was going to come back and really do something, and I realized this is it. This, it doesn't need anything else. So it was the middle of the night, and I, I had the structure, the billboard structure, and I had such a hard time putting the vinyl. It wasn't getting straight, and, and I was like in tears because I just, I, it was too many hours, like 18 hours of me trying to get this thing to work. And some guy comes to me, and I was like, please don't let it be like someone who's you know, on drugs. I'm just not, I was like so on the edge. And the guy comes up to me and he's like, and he's recognized Al. He's like, that's Al. He's like, he always has that smirk on his face. I don't know if you could see the smirk, but he has a smirk. And he, he started talking about Big Will. And he's like, he always has that sad look in his eye. He's like, I need to call him. And I thought, that's it. I kind of did what I wanted to do. It's a space for discourse. Like sculpture art is a space for discourse, a space to connect, a space for engagement, a space to like agitate, you know, a space to like kind of make us move or get up for a second. So I was pretty excited that it worked out. But I just, so I did this image. And then I wanted to be that my image was up for a month or two and then other things would go up. So my image ended up staying up for two years, but finally it shifted where it's very cheap to put up a vinyl. So it just rotates. So this is like a picture of a Mexican family in the neighborhood. Someone did like Black Power. There's about sustainable food and good and, and healthy eating. This was an interesting one. There's a, this um, great museum down in Houston called the Manil Collection. Um, and Somehow they decided to advertise, uh, I guess it was a month where there wasn't anyone who wanted to put an image. So they decided to put an ad for a Luke Toyman show that was up. So it's called, so you see in the back it says nice. Someone in the neighborhood put another sign that says nice. <laughs> I don't know if you can see, but that's, that's um, Tupac, a very famous uh, uh, legendary uh, hip hop star. So I just thought that was, so, so in a way there was a whole controversy about this and someone's like, emailed me and said, Karen, did you do that thing? And I was like, that's when it functions, when people forget your, I feel like it functions when people don't think about the artist. Do you know what I mean? And someone, some, but someone's like, who did that? Who? And I was like, that was me, and it was, it was perfect. But I thought there was, a, and there was a whole controversy, there was all these blogs going on, people saying, no, not having, people said, why is a Manil coming here, this elitist art institution? And other people said, well, you're making the assumption that poor people or black people won't want to see art. And then someone's like, but no, it was a space that was supposed to be a different space. But I was like, who cares? It actually didn't stay static. It actually engaged the area. The nicest thing was just like, damn it, perfect. So I did that project. So the billboard thing I don't think would have happened if I didn't live in Houston. I mean, being in New York, yes, their billboards are there, but they have a different sort of presence and weight. You're sitting in traffic, you feel them. They have the same sort of density as the building. So you don't really think about them. But I moved down to Houston um, like a week before September 11th to do this residency. And, and it was strange being there for that reason. It was a very um, conservative, you know, let's fight kind of place. Um, but I remember driving on the, on the highway and billboards just seemed kind of innocuous. So it's just like, oh, you know, advertising these things. And you, or it was a strange place feeling as though all the world, the city, the country, and the world's in turmoil, and they were just going on like business as usual, like oil money is being made. I mean, it was such a strange place to be. So I was thinking, well, if all these people have to commute, you know, that everyone's on, everyone's driving, it's such a driving culture, maybe I could do something with this space. 
So I was thinking about Magritte's painting, The Human Condition, where it's like the image of the, from the window. But then I was also thinking about Felix Gonzalez Torres, which was another one of those pieces, that's one of the first art pieces I, I saw on a billboard that I didn't, I wasn't doing art yet, but I kept thinking about the bed. And I would see it every day on my way to work. And I, was, I always thought about it. It's like, is this an ad? And eventually it made me think of something else, even though I didn't know it was Felix Gonzalez Torres. So I think about him in this piece. I'm thinking, okay, people are on this freeway every, every day. The billboards are there for you to pay attention to. But maybe if I kind of erase the billboard, the invisible is what you pay attention to, or you think you catch this, like you think you see this, or you all of a sudden you go from kind of in a numb zone of driving to all of a sudden you kind of wake up because you're not sure what you saw. So the billboards were only up for a month, which I was really, which was really smart because I didn't want it to get to the point where you don't see them too. So here's some images from, and I thought it was all going to be about this surreal moment because when you're driving, no matter what lane you're in, at some point they line up. Um, but I, I thought that was going to be the moment, but it really became about other things, like when they were kind of became these paintings or, or when they were like off. And this to me was like, I really wanted to, it was like my nod to Felix um, Perfect Lovers, the clocks. But I wanted to also to just make, make it, the artifice be so obvious. Like it, these, are, these are representations of what's behind, they're not the thing. It's, I wanted to talk about veracity and, and artifice. I was driving down the freeway and I was stuck in traffic and I look over and I was like, oh my God, there it is. Okay, I think I only have a couple more projects. Um, this, I was invited to do a, be part of a show on contemporary Caribbean art, which is really, really exciting because I, uh, often my, my work sometimes engages the Caribbean or to me the Caribbean is so personal that it, it's not so obviously seen, but I was pretty excited to do the show at Real Art Ways. So, I, but I really didn't want to do anything in the museum because I felt as though it's the fourth largest, you know, Caribbean population in, in the state. So why don't I do something in the, in the neighborhood? So I decided to use a grocery store. So I talked about this this morning to the folks, how I feel very much that I'm Caribbean, but I did leave when I was one and I have this thing where you feel like you're tied to your culture because of, my love for the music and the food, and I go back home, I go back often enough, and so I'm thinking I'm really tied, I, I'm up on enough political stuff to know what's going on, but then I started to think about my, my education and how I'm much more Western, I'm much more, I'm much more American, so I kept thinking about other signifiers for culture, and I was thinking, okay, books. So I was thinking, so I decided to put a library that was only Caribbean titles in this grocery store, and I kind of played around with where I put things, like. That's like a whole row of jerk jerk sauces. So I put some Jamaican novels there. This is uh, like kind of politically charged titles I put by the hot pepper sauces. So I kind of wanted to have fun, fun with it too. So anyone who came to the store could take out the books. And I was thinking about, you know, you go to these stores and these stores are really traffic, again, nostalgia for home. Or like you're walking there with the idea of getting certain provisions that you feel like you need, but maybe you kind of need the books more. Or like, or the idea of like, this is a place that you're buying, buying your memory. But then also like, these books are being bartered, you could just take them. So to try and put these different economies can exist in the same, same place. And, and not that everyone would know this, like, but I put this here for me, like these are the Trinidadian titles. And this, I put it among this candy dried fruit. And it's just from like a memory of like growing up, like at the beginning of December, my mom would get huge jars of this fruit and you soak um, rum and pour it and, and wine in it and you make this cake called black cake for Christmas. So for me, it was like having this here was like about my, like, my personal childhood. This was like a lot of the smaller islands. I just wanted to be funny and put them by all the beans, Bahamas. Um, children's books were along with um, the biscuits and cookies. The front of the store had Haitian sodas and, and I, it was, I did this, it was right after the, the earthquake. So I kind of was happy to be able to put the Haitian titles in the front. These are books on culture, and I thought this was this was kind of interesting. It's like things from the different cultures. Like in Jamaica, it could be a very macho, kind of aggressive culture. There's drinks called like bedroom bully, you know, secret stallion. Really, really kind of a, it could be very aggressive. And I was thinking, as much as I'm kind of against some of that really um, macho culture, that's part of part of part of Caribbean culture as well. 
as just as much as like the root tonics that have been around for like hundreds and hundreds of years. Like they all kind of make up who we are. And then I was just enjoying how, how it, it's a sculpture in a way that doesn't sit still. And I'm really into the idea of like, it should be restless. It should still keep changing its function. So the idea of like, when a book gets taken out, the reading of it's gonna be different or I'm enjoying like how a, a phrase like skin folk sounds against hard dough. You know, this is you know how it's supposed to function. You you know, and then I did it in um, in Canada, and it was a little different. There, the store was maybe a tenth the size, so it was really packed. So the books really became kind of seamless in the store, and um, because it was in Canada, we have different titles. There are a lot of books that are from Canadian Caribbean folks, so we it wasn't the same books. And I was pretty excited about that. I'm trying to do it in Miami. We're going to have like one in the Haitian store and then maybe one in Little Havana and maybe one in like a main branch. So I'm hoping to continue this project. So I really enjoyed how it, it, it's, it can't be the same. So it was up for um, a month and she's like, it's Easter, so I have to take it down because she needed all the shelf space. But she said people are super into it. So after Easter, they're going put it, to put it back up and keep the library going. Um, this... This is a project I did in, in Mexico City. And I, had, I told the kids this morning about how in Trinidad, like the, 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 the concrete Jer Jersey barriers between the highway become filled with fruit and becomes like a market when it's kind of rush hour. And when I, was when I got to Mexico City, I was just really aware of how similar it feels to Trinidad, where like all life happens on the street. There's kind of almost like no separation or like everything gets reused or everything has can have multiple functions or like one use could then have this new use and I was kind of um, surprised that none of the the concrete barriers I, w I didn't see them being used in another way so I decided just to kind of take what happens in Trinidad and plant it in front of the gallery so one level you're taking this barrier that's supposed to be in conversation with you know cars in the street and now it has to kind of deal with pedestrians on the sidewalk and then you kind of have to navigate this thing that's kind of both announcing and and keeping you away from the gallery. So every morning I went to the to the market that was like two blocks away and just lined it with with fruit. And I never really ever saw anyone take it. But I was thinking about I was also thinking about um, you know you go to the center of the city in Mexico City and you know you know it's like filled with pyramids that you know the Spanish came they they tore them down and beautiful cathedrals are built and the idea was that they had these thresholds that you kind of had to climb over. So in a way so you're really aware of that you're entering the sacred space. So maybe I could take some of that and turn that into like a gallery space. So, so I just, just a different day, every day was like different, different grouping. Then it started just being used. I saw people having lunch there, relaxing there. How are we with time? Because I have the last. Okay, we don't have time to continue with another three minutes. Okay, I'll just go through these. Um, this is a photo I took in, in Tobago. And I was thinking about how, and I don't know, it probably happens in many places, but in, in developing countries, particularly in Trinidad, you'll see people buy building materials as they have money. And then you, as you have more and more money, we have enough, you then can do the building. But in the meantime, they, they change their use. So here it became a, a clothes drying. I have this here as a clothes drying rack. So then I, I made that piece and I kept thinking, I wanted to make some sort of portrait, but a portrait in, in three dimensions. So I decided to make uh, a concrete wall. Let me go back. So this is in my studio. And, and it, it's hard to tell, but um, yeah. it's mirror. So it's a strange thing where at once it became solid, but then it looked completely trans transparent. And each, I kind of had a hand, I had to cut the mirror, but then each cinder block opening is different. So I had to kind of custom fit each one there. So this is where it was in this space. Good, Mary. So again, I, I'm thinking about objects and function and use. This is a piece um, I found at an abandoned um, um, flour mill in Kansas. And I brought it back to my studio. And it, was, it said danger. It was painted yellow. And I kept thinking how how it got so weathered, this thing that once kind of was a barrier, kind of had authority and it had kind of represented a certain sort of power, like who's allowed in and who's not, or also a place to protect, protect you. All of a sudden it kind of lost its power, it was kind of really wonky, like you see the curve of the leg and 
So I decided, like, what can I do to kind of restore some of its, restore it back to its, like, former stance, or, or at least make something that references its former function. So I just made these little, this, uh, just little wooden feet, just so it could be stable again. And then I took off the paint and I decided that that was the color of that, that it was. I decided that would just be the echo of its former life. And these are, I've just been working on a photo series. Like I've been working on these big projects and I was just trying to find a way to do something that was quicker or more playful. So I've been spending summers in Maine and collecting these things from the shore and just using the things around my studio and setting up little still lifes and trying to play around with abstraction, play around with like having someone desire to touch these things but not having that access. Um, I've been thinking about like the haptic and touch. And I also almost feel like these are diaristic but also studies. I think these are the last couple. Oh, I could finish though with just this. <laughs> I thought I was done. I thought I was finishing with photos. What the heck? You we're done with time.